Welcome to this video on the limitations of adaptive immunity. We're going to take a situation in which adaptive immunity worked great. You had um, cells that learned to recognize um, the pathogen, and I'm going to use pink for these antibodies that they learned to make. So you have B cells that are proliferating into plasma cells, you have cytotoxic T cells, and um, uh, you have an army of memory cells for down the road. So these would be um, memory B cells, and you have memory T cells, and these cells keep proliferating over the years so that they're able to um, spring into action if needed. And in the case of the memory B cells, their offspring will continue to make antibodies. So many, many years later, you could take a blood draw and do a titer and find that you are making antibodies to something you became immune to 50 years ago. So the two elements then are that we have a continuous production of antibodies over time and a high enough level that it could take out the pathogen if it encountered it. And not only that, but these antibodies um, are able to um, gradually fit better and better to if, if they have repeated exposure. So they fit better and better to the pathogen. Over time with repeated exposure. and that will stimulate further production of these memory cells so these populations stay nice, nice and healthy. So I'm going to put that next too. So the memory cell populations will remain um, healthy. And then I'm going to give you three scenarios where things don't work exactly like they should to keep you immune for the rest of your life. Okay, so scenario one is a process called antigenic variation that allows pathogens to hide from our immune system. So we're going to write scenario one, antigenic variation. We'll highlight that in blue. So scenario one, antigenic variation, make a blue arrow like this. And now I've drawn an example of a pathogen that your immune system learned to recognize. So let's say this is the pathogen in green. And then we'll put some different antigens on its surface. Maybe it had uh, this type of antigen, and then it had a different kind of antigen, and then it had a particular antigen that the host had a T cell that could recognize, and then uh, it stimulated B cells to make antibodies to this particular antigen, and then army of cytotoxic T cells that could destroy these cells directly. So we'll make the antibody pink, so this represents an antibody that correctly matches. In fact, maybe we want to put this here, match. And that's good. And that is what you want to have happen. But what about if over time, or maybe on the next exposure, uh, the next season, now this pathogen is no longer displaying that antigen. It's varying its antigens. So we'll represent that on our notes. Instead of using orange, this purple color says, hey, this is a different antigen now. And it's not that the, that the pathogen has lost the ability to make this antigen. It might just decide not to express it that season. So that's what the flu virus can do. It displays different antigens in different years. So maybe it's still displaying this blue antigen, and maybe it's still displaying this yellow antigen, but that's no, those aren't the ones that our body learned to recognize. They only learned to recognize the orange one that time you got the flu, for example. So now there's no match anymore. This antibody isn't designed to fit that antigen, so no match.
And that means that all the trouble that your body went to do to make the memory B cells and make the memory T cells is sort of all for naught the next time you're exposed to it. So the examples in real life that this um, happens with is uh, for those of us in these temperate climates, absolutely the influenza virus is an example of this. So what this means is you could get the flu every year because every year it's putting out different antigens. Now there might be some times that those same antigens come back around and you are immune that year, but there aren't a lot of studies on this sort of thing. But what we do know is that you can get the flu and become immune to that strain. And then if the antigens are varied in the next season, you could get the flu all over again. So the flu vaccine is where scientists try to predict which antigens will be displayed that season. And then they make the vaccine so that you'll make antibodies to the antigens that are displayed that year. And that is why the flu vaccine always has a fairly big percentage of failure rate because they are never going to predict it perfectly um, so that everyone is going to be immune that year. Okay, so that's one example. And then for people that live in tropical climates, a famous example would be plasmodium, which is a protist that causes malaria. So they, someone that gets malaria in a tropical climate they um, could become immune that time around, but then the very next year they could get malaria again because there are many uh, different antigens that plasmodium may um, present on its surface that given year. Okay, so let's go on to scenario two, the thief of time. So we can go ahead and color our blue arrow down and scenario two is the thief of time. So as time goes on, some of those memory cells die off. Memory cells don't last forever. It's the use it or lose it concept. So if they're not repeatedly stimulated by the pathogen, then they will um, over time die off and what that does is it makes room, because you don't want to have your blood filled with white blood cells, that would be leukemia. So this makes room for uh, memory cells that match uh, common pathogens. So if you um, don't experience exposure to that pathogen again, then eventually those memory cells will say, hey, we're not being used. We need to basically commit suicide, you know, apoptosis, so that there's room for other memory cells. Because you can't have a huge army of memory cells um, to every single thing you've ever encountered. And so the ones that are less frequently encountered will die off. So hopefully that makes sense. So the thief of time, the memory cells will die off if not repeatedly stimulated in order to make room for memory cells that match common pathogens or commonly experienced. Maybe we should put that. So ones that you're exposed to more frequently. Okay, good example for this one is uh, varicella. So if someone gets chickenpox when they are a child, then they will uh, hopefully um, start to make antibodies to that varicella. And although it's hard to eradicate it completely from your body because it likes to hide in your nerve endings, um, it will um, at least patrol to keep it from causing problems. So it defends against another outbreak. And the theory goes that as we get older and we're exposed to, let's say, children that are having chicken pox, that stimulates our memory cells to keep proliferating. But if we aren't exposed to people that are ha having chicken pox, then our memory cells will eventually die off and then you might find that someone will eventually get shingles. Um, if a decrease in immunity to the varicella may result in shingles. And there's other reasons that people probably could get shingles. I'm just trying to give you an example of one possible scenario. And then you've all heard of booster shots. And booster shots are designed to prevent this dying off of the memory cells. It's 
So they're intended to prevent this. And then the other thing I'd like to say here is let's say you don't want to have to go get another measles vaccine. You can have a titer drawn. And a titer measures the level of antibodies that your cells are still making to the pathogen. And so it gives you a baseline idea of your current immunity to something. So it measures your current immunity by measuring the antibodies. Your, how about if I put antibody, that's short for antibody, production. And then uh, different policies exist about what the antibody level needs to be before you would be declared, you know, protected from a disease. And if you're below that number, then they would ask you to have the vaccination over again, let's say if you worked in a healthcare setting. Okay, so then let's go to scenario three, cross reactivity. So we'll use our blue highlighter for scenario three, and then make your blue arrow, and then write cross reactivity. This is when you make an antibody to a pathogen that unfortunately also matches ugh, a part of your own body. This is a horrible, oops, horrible one. So we will, oops, cross reactivity. Let's use our green highlighter for the pathogen. And all pathogens have multiple antigens. So, you know, let's put that orange one on again that we're saying, oh, this is the one that our antibodies recognize. This is the one we made the match to, and that's good. And then just to remind ourselves that they're always making, they have other antigens as well that antibodies could have been made for. Oops, I just had a highlighter hit the floor and roll away. So that is good. So let's write here that the antibody matches the pathogen antigen. That's good, but unfortunately, the particular antibody that we made that recognizes that antigen also recognizes a very similar antigen on our heart valves, for example, that's a classic one. So this would be very sad. And this happens sometimes, um, it also matches, for example, I'm going to use this for example, heart valves. This is a classic um, rheumatic fever that can happen. Rheuma means that their joints hurt during this too, and we'll talk about that as well. But rheumatic fever is when the antibodies that someone makes to Streptococcus pyogenes match the Strep pyogenes, but they also match um, heart valve proteins. And then that, dam that means your own body will damage your heart valves. And this can cause a heart murmur or a weakened heart over time. Because it makes the, when the valve is damaged, then the heart has to work harder. Okay, so then another um, example would be a kidney. So let's use, um, again, our pink antibody. And it is binding, unfortunately, to an antigen that is exposed rest on the kidneys and so this cross reactivity can cause um, uh, what's called glomerulonephritis. So that would be bad too, matching something on the kidneys and this would be called glomerulonephritis and this is another one that is um, established, has been established that can happen after a strep infection. And then the the third really common one that I'm pointing out, because this could happen anywhere in your body, but these ones are the, probably the most famous. So here's an example, two bones meeting. This is a joint. Well, on the joint, there are often antigens that are the same that the pathogen was displaying. And so the antibodies can also cross-react and damage joints. So if they damage joint cells, then there's a name for this called reactive arthritis. 
and it sort of implied that it's after an infection, but I'm going to put this in your notes just so that you remember. This is, let's say someone had a, a bad diarrheal infection from bat food poisoning, and then they were able to make antibodies to the pathogen in their gut, but then those antibodies also matched on the joints. And so this is so common that it, you know, it has a name, reactive arthritis, and is it believed every year I seem to hear more and more information that with many cases of arthritis, an underlying infection could have stimulated an autoimmune reaction. Okay, so in the next video, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we make different kinds of white blood cells and um, then how they're trained in your lymph organs. See you in the next video.